Hey guys, on this episode of Unbeatable, I get the chance to talk to one of the most courageous men I've ever seen in my life. I've been waiting to have this conversation for 29 years. I get a chance to talk to Brad Thomas. I'm gonna introduce you to this incredibly talented musician, this amazing warrior, and a guy who did something on the battlefield that I will carry with me for the rest of my life on this episode of Unbeatable. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Let's talk about this uh, moment when I was a squad leader in 3rd Ranger Battalion and I'm in the barracks with, with you and the rest of the guys from Bravo Company in 3rd Battoon. And you pick up a guitar, not even having more than just a few weeks uh, with this song on the radio and you bang out the first few notes to Under the Bridge by Red Hot Chili Peppers with no planning, no practice, no preparation. And I was like, listen, what B.B. King did while he was in the U.S. Army, what um, Jimi Hendrix did while he was in the U.S. Army, Brad Thomas is doing the exact same thing. I'm like... If, if guitarists were precious metals, those guys would be, you know, platinum and uh, I'd, I'd be like tinfoil. No, man, I'm yeah. telling you, I heard you bang out the beginning of <laughs> Under the Bridge and I was like, there is nothing that this guy can't play on guitar. And I've always thought you're one of the most talented guitarists I've ever heard in my life. Well, I uh, I appreciate that. It's, I'm, I'm a person that uh, I never was a technician and I'm not a super pyrotechnic player. And if I, if I try and relate to someone, it's a person that's actually not a guitar player. And uh, Lane Staley from Allison Chains, as an example, right. never picked up a guitar before in his life. And Jerry Cantrell, their, their guitarist, gave him a guitar. And he wrote the song Angry Chair, which is one of their classics. Yeah. And it's, it's something that's so simple. Um, you know, and if you, if you hear that song, you'll realize it's just one or two notes, uh -huh. but what a great, powerful, deep, heavy song. Um, I love their music. I've always connected with the stuff that's generally speaking, it's not the Van Halen party pop, yeah. you know, there we are in the limo having fun doing, doing whatnot. It's, yeah. it's always the stuff that's had some depth. And, uh, anyway, that's, that's the stuff that I love. So if I, identifier with a player it's it's generally him who's not even a guitar player well that uh just goes to show you how talented you are man because i could listen to that song and not recognize that there's only a couple of notes in it and you uh can immediately i'm serious man back in the day way back years ago when we were all working together i used to think one of the most talented voices that i've heard in the army was also in the same platoon and also had the last name thomas <laughs> Kenny Thomas had one of the most talented voices. Brad Thomas, one of the most talented guys I've ever heard on a guitar and in the same platoon at the same time, but no relation to one another. We were actually roommates for a short period of time. We went to Ranger School together, my second time to Ranger School. And uh, I can't say that we were super close. We just yeah. had different agendas and different sure. things going on. And he, I think, was much more in the college crowd of course, and would yeah. go hang out with college people and things like that. And, and I had my barracks buddies and, <laughs> and, uh, whatnot. So anyway, we finished, uh, ranger school in November and he had nowhere to go for Christmas and was supposed to go see his dad uh -huh. who was a ranger in yep. Vietnam. Right. And it kind of fell through and I, I felt horribly for him. So I hit up my folks and said, look, I've got a buddy that's coming home and they gave half of all of my Christmas gifts to uh, Kenny, which what? was almost all clothing. <laughs> so they're, yeah. And I was they like, were like, Man, hey, he, he, it already says to back. Thomas on it. Yeah. We might as well just scratch out Brad and put Kenny. Yeah, we're, you know, we we're roughly the same size yeah. and everything else. So anyway, he got a bunch of super 90s uh, shirts and things like that that were supposed to be That's mine. That's awesome. Yeah, with, what a collection of people. I'm just sitting there trying to imagine the musical genius in the barracks with you and Kenny in the barracks at the same time. We we tried. He got the uh, before he got his cornbread band uh -huh. stood up, which ended up doing really well. Yeah. And then he kind of transitioned to country music, more country music yeah. than anything else. He was really like a Darius Rucker. Yeah. Uh, before Darius Rucker 
you know, was a thing. And uh, he and I tried to make some things work. We played down at the loft one oh, time. Oh, really? Yeah. When that first opened up, which must have been 94, 95 yeah. time frame. And it just didn't work out. I was into stuff that's much darker and heavier, and he was into maybe more inspirational, uh, yep. uh, you know, stuff. So it just didn't click. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. Well, I was telling Kenny. Kenny did an episode. Uh, actually, he did episode number one for me, and I told him he's the only guy I've ever met that has enough rhythm that he can actually run with calling cadence <laughs> singing johnny be good as an army cadence nobody else has enough rhythm to pull that off yeah and when i listened to you pick up the guitar i was just blown away man because you could play classical you could play metal you could play anything um and honestly almost play it by ear it just blew me away your talent and right. i i had no idea just how talented you are till i heard that opening riff from under the bridge my uh, idiot savant brain uh, I started playing music when I was five. Really? And my parents, I grew up, you know, really uh, well-to-do family and everybody intact and all of that. And I'm very fortunate and thankful for that. Um, they exposed me to live music. And I, I don't know even really where that came from, but they bought a summer concert series at an outdoor pavilion that was near where I grew nice. up. Nice. And I saw Barry Manilow, I saw Chicago, I saw the Beach Boys, and a handful of others that I don't remember. Um, and as soon as I saw that, I was like, that's what I want to do. And they bought a piano, and with the agreement that I would take piano lessons, yeah. so I started on piano, played piano for maybe four or five years, and then transitioned to clarinet and saxophone and a whole bunch of other stuff. And about 1980, 81... When I started getting into ACDC uh -huh. and Rush and all of that stuff, um, I recognized that you can't play that on a saxophone. <laughs> so <laughs> I that. found a uh, guitar in our house. We had this little crappy undersized acoustic guitar that probably belonged to my sister and was missing strings and just started plinking around on it. My ear was already trained, so I could. I just had yeah. to really train my hands what to do. And uh, that's how I learned to play. <laughs> Drop the needle on an album. Uh -huh. And, you know, er, go back to it and go back to it and just kind of mimic it. That's funny. That's how some of the greatest blues guitarists of all time picked up a guitar with three of the six strings missing and played the same three notes again <laughs> until they could do the next very, three notes and do the next three notes. Yeah, very true. Did you study classical guitar in, so in school? I went to, if you want to call it that, sure. I went to college for uh, just about a year and I I really was like, I was in bands and doing that thing, and I didn't want to go to college. Yeah. It just all my friends yeah. were doing it, and I didn't really have a plan. So, uh, okay, I'll go to college. Uh, what do you want to do in college? I met with uh, counselors and things. They had me bring a guitar in, and I played them some music. They said, well, can you read music? No, I can't read music. So, <laughs> of course not. So I started in all the most basic level courses. I did voice, uh, classical piano, uh, music theory and classical guitar and you know was literally learning at well below my ability uh -huh. but didn't know how to read music and so they were trying to teach me that and it just lost interest really and uh, really the the thing that drove it home was my voice class was with most of the uh, thespians and we would stand in a theater and on the All stage right. with a, a piano accompanist yeah. And there I am, you know, hair mid chest, uh -huh. uh, trying to stand on the sa stage singing these classical Italian love songs. And trying to look cool and, doing it, which is almost impossible, it was, right? It was horrible. So that, that was kind of it. And, uh, and that kind of led me to the next thing. Yeah. Well, um, before we get into us serving together in the Army, um, I'm doing this little uh, segment this season. This is season two of Unbeatable, and I have this segment where I just want the guests to get a chance to know you a little bit better. Um, so I've got this purely hypothetical question. It's just a one question um, uh, question for you, but... Let's imagine that you, so you're a busy guy with lots going on. You have a, you still have a lot of connections to the military. You have a band that's doing very, very well, family, lots of responsibilities. But let's just imagine that you've got an entire day 
with nothing on your agenda, no work that still needs to get done. You can basically spend this one day doing anything you want to do anywhere you want to do it. And it's not going to put you behind at all. So what do you spend that day doing and why? Uh, 100% it would be on the beach and probably doing some surfing. All right. Uh, I probably have a guitar on the beach and then it, it finishes up with some sort of nice cocktail, not to get drunk, okay. but just to enjoy an incredibly nice meal. All right. So, so you're surfing during the day, you're playing guitar when the sun goes down and you're sitting there just chilling with a drink in your hand yeah, when the some, moon is reflecting off of the water. Some good seafood, steak, salad type Man. of, you know, something good. I like your style, Brad. That sounds like a really, <laughs> really good day to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, let's go back. Man, it feels like forever now, 29 years ago. Um, we worked together for what? Almost two years, I think, in the Ranger Regiment. And um, you were in Somalia. And Brad, there's a character who plays you in the movie Black Hawk Down. But I have told audiences, I, you and I haven't had this conversation before. But I have told countless audiences about you in Somalia, and I always tell them you're one of the most courageous men that I know. So I want to talk about this moment that makes it into the movies. In fact, I don't even know how it made it into the movie Black Hawk Down, but I don't think the movie did you justice. Um, and right behind you, by the way, is the official James Dietz print of the x fill when everybody's getting on the Humvees and the assault force is running to, to jump on the vehicles with us and roll back out of the city. Um, yeah. But by the time that we're in Somalia, you've been in the Ranger Regiment for what, about two years? Yeah, I, I got there in April of 91. Okay. And I I had a unique experience in that. When I got there, I was the twelfth guy in my squad. So there wow. were there were eleven others, and by that September, uh, we spent the in, almost the entire summer in the swamps of Fort Benning, and it was miserable. To this day, that's probably the hardest thing that I've ever done in the military was that that four month five month stretch of time. And we did some airfield seizure stuff in between there, but. Some cool stuff, but most of it was just nugging it out in the swamp. Yeah, and it's, you know, we back then we did, as you know, we did like graded exercise. So yeah. platoon level, squad level, company level, all that jazz. Um, by that September, I was the fourth guy in the squad. So Good gracious. There was a, there was a squad leader, two team leaders, and me. Uh, Larry Garner, Jimmy Dixon, and uh, Jeff Phillips. And then I think yeah. Jeff Phillips left. So... I took a PT test and they sent me to ranger school with with having about all of four or five months under my belt. Yeah, and about not, 0% body fat <laughs> and still busted up from the swamps, right? Not, not knowing anything that I'm doing. I'm a private, just being told what to do in the woods. I have no clue. I'm smoked. I can barely hang on. And uh, here I am in ranger school. When I got to ranger school, our uh, our, our company or actually got yanked out of one company and put into another company. Wow. And there were people that were ranger instructors at the time that were really upset that I was there that fast. Really? Yeah. And it worked against me. My platoon sergeant, a guy named uh, Tony Winterfeld, uh, Jeff Phillips ended up out wow. there at RTB, uh, Pete Rosell, uh, JD Duncan. There were a whole crew that ended up out there. And all of a sudden it's like, Thomas, what are you doing yeah. here? Why are you here? Like you're, it's your fault. You're a brand new guy. <laughs> so they gave me some extra love. Uh -huh. I'll just say it that way. Air and, quotes. Yeah. Air quotes, extra love. And it, it really turned into a disaster and, uh, you know, wasn't a, a good experience at all. I begged for a day one recycle after doing three phases. Uh -huh. And next thing I know, I get bounced out of ranger school and I'm back in B company. And that's about the time that, that I showed I, up, right? Yeah, that you and I connect. Yeah. Used to be back in those days. And by the way, this just goes to show what how valuable that you were to the company. Um, back in those days, if you got sent back to the unit, you're done. Um, mm -hmm. 
I went to, I don't know if you're aware of this, man. I went to pre-ranger um, and didn't make it through the first day and got sent home. And I was convinced that they were going to kick me out of the ranger regiment. And um, they gave me like another six, eight weeks to prepare, went back to pre-ranger and then, then off to ranger school. But you know, you heard like I did, uh, like, Hey, either you come back with a ranger tab on your shoulders or just don't come back at all. Cause we don't want you. Right. Yeah. Or you're gone. So I was actually having this conversation earlier with a, uh, former, uh, B company buddy. And it had to do with, uh, where my son is and everything and yeah. headed to rasp here, hopefully in the next few months. Um, they are in the process now of sending guys that go to rasp because it's a lot more, difficult. Yeah. It's a lot more educational. Uh, when they get done, they go to airborne school and then they come back and they have the opportunity to go to, I think they call it cert, which is almost like a pre-ranger right. and then go right to ranger school. Yeah. So the conversation, and maybe, maybe your listeners already know this about you, but were you an RRD ranger recon? Did you come right yeah. out of I, I don't think that you and I would have ever had that conversation back in the day, right. but I've always been interested because I ended up there, um, you know, how that happened and how that worked. Yeah. Brad, I never should have made it in the Ranger Regiment and um, I shouldn't have survived. And I, I'm being honest with you, man. I, I really, I almost didn't survive the first couple of months of us working together um, because I was in the recon detachment for my first four years in the Ranger Regiment. And it was a huge uh they took a huge risk on me. And to be frank, I think for the first year and a half or two years, I was nothing but a liability to the unit. There was so much that I needed to learn and I just didn't have that. It wasn't until I had been around for about a year and a half or two years that I was able to start adding value to that organization. But it was against their will. Um, I only learned this after the fact that the sergeant major of the Ranger Regiment basically told them, you've got a position on the books for a private and you're going to take a private whether you want one or not. And mm -hmm. I happen to be one of those privates. Actually, they 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 took an entire RIP class, narrowed it down to just a handful. Then they tried a couple of us and uh, most of the rest of them didn't make it. But I showed up there as a private. Um, which means I didn't get that full exposure to uh, life in the line companies and just how brutal that mission is. Um, I do like to tell people the only uh, thing that set me up to succeed after that is I was literally the first guy to show up as a private in the history of the unit um, in the recon detachment. And when I showed up, it was me, one officer and 20, sergeant, 20 NCOs. Yeah. And they just... <laughs> took turns smoking me all day long, every day for like the first nine months. It's, uh, hey, my turn, tag out. The next guy tags in. And that's what my first nine months in the Ranger Regiment was like. And it was brutal. So did you go to, how how quickly did you get a Ranger school and military yeah, free fall? And those I, types of I things? went to Ranger school at about six and a half, seven months. Um, I did a couple of deployments overseas with recon and I was just a pack mule for them. Um, came back from ranger school, did a couple of other local training things, and then got sent off to free fall. So I'd been in the army for about a year and a half, and I was already free fall. I'm already on my way to jump master. I've already got more stuff on my uniform than a lot of guys have been in the army for 10 years. Um, but the learning curve was so steep there. Uh, honestly, I never caught up with the, I, I was never able to give the unit what they needed from me for about a year and a half or two years. And it was every day, all day long, just doing my best to try to deliver what they needed out of me. That's, that's interesting. I, uh, you know, when I think to that, it puts you in a situation where when you show up as a squad leader in third platoon, you're almost in a way you're almost an import. And no one viewed you that way. You know, I, I remember that specifically because you grew up in the regiment. Yeah. But I don't think any of us knew. I, I think the appearance was that, you know, you were lucky and that you got pulled in and got all these schools and the pipeline and it's all great. And he doesn't have to deal with any of the harassment or any of that. And so I'm actually learning something for the first time. That's why I asked the question because yeah. I know... I know I was interested and I figure other people. Well, would let be me tell you uh, just how bad this was for me because I didn't go through the same pipeline you did. The recon mission, as you know, is radically different than what it is in the line. And so I leave recon and I come over to work with you. 
Um, and my first couple of months over there, it's really obvious that I have a lot of learning to do because of uh, figuring out how to fight as a squad, how to maneuver fire teams. And I told, uh, I've said this publicly a couple of other times, the reason why I didn't get fired as a squad leader is because of Rick Merritt. Hmm. So true story. Um, when we go to Panama and we're down there doing just call or doing some training in JOTC in the jungle, um, we're getting ready to roll out the door and Rick pulls me off to the side and Rick and I are both squad leaders. And I, you probably are not aware that this conversation happened, but no. Rick said, Hey Jeff, uh, you probably are aware of this. I'm absolutely aware of this. You know, you're about to get fired if you don't figure some things out. And I said, I know Rick, I'm doing the best I can. And I'm, I, you know, I'm learning as fast as I can. He's like, Jeff, can I help you out here? So true story, Brad. He pulls me off to the side while you guys are all doing uh, other stuff and kind of chilling in um, Fort Sherman, Panama. And he starts to teach me how to maneuver fire teams, how to do a movement to contact, how to employ a ranger squad in an ambush. And he gives me like a little, no kidding, one hour class right there on the side of the um, barracks. And he's the reason why I didn't get fired because up to that moment, I was, I was struggling, but I was, I was trying to learn as fast as I could, but I knew I didn't know what it takes to lead a, a ranger squad in combat. And Rick recognized that. And Rick is the reason I didn't get fired. That's a, uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Definitely haven't heard that story, nor was it ever public knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like anybody was sitting around the barracks talking, smack behind your back or anything like that but i wasn't in panama so i must have been in ranger yeah school you were in ranger point. school i'm pretty sure and um, uh but yeah the, the impression was never um i i never had that impression that you didn't know what was going on or what you were doing if anything we were all kind of figuring it out together yeah. um most people i've i've found that most people that i talk to about rangering ranger school pre-ranger rip rasp whatever you want to call it you're really just struggling to survive. Yeah, you are. It's not a learning. It's not a learning environment, and you can call it a leadership school. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but the reality is, you really don't know what you're doing. And life in the Ranger Battalion was so intense that it was the same way. You yeah. you were just struggling to kind of stay alive and stay afloat. And it wasn't until I came back from Ranger School unsuccessful, you. Um, probably don't remember this, but you allowed me to maneuver a team as a PFC on a live fire range. So you had set up, we were doing squad movement to contact something or other. And you were like, all right, you take the flanking element around and you're going to, you know, you're going to do that. And I thought, I actually know what I'm doing now, you know, and it was, you know, probably at the 12 month, yeah. 14 month, yeah. you know, mark or something like that, that, that I had been there, but it, it took that long. And uh, so that's why I'm curious with this new, you know, program that the regimen is considering and has you yeah. know, kind of started to do is, is it, is it really good to send these guys? Cause I feel like they're going to end up and who am I to say, right? I'm not there now. Um, but I feel like they're going to end up in a situation where they're just drinking from the fire hose. They're struggling to keep their yeah. head above water and they're going to show up as a tabbed PFC, maybe, uh, with a year in the army, you know, a year and a half in the army with no leadership experience, right. you know, none of that. So, well, you know, the pace is just so breakneck in that unit that it's almost impossible to catch up. Either you got it or you don't. Yeah. Um, and maybe part of this is just an, a, a, a much longer um, assessment process. Um, because if the guy can make it through steps one, two, three, and 10, then he's got the potential to keep, you know, delivering what the unit needs for them for a long time. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to go back in just a few minutes to your son, um, because on Veterans Day weekend, I think it's a really big deal that you came to Fort Benning, Georgia to see your son. Um, but before we get to that, man, I got to tell you, there's a moment. Um, I don't know if anybody has told you, but I mentioned you almost every time um, I'm speaking to audiences. And I've said this to one or two other guys that were with us in Somalia. Um, but I'm convinced that I was surrounded by two of the bravest men that have ever walked on planet Earth. They both happen to be named Brad. Um, one of them was stepping or one of them was st uh, standing right above me and the other one was right behind me. And the two most courageous men that I have ever seen in all of my combat experiences all over the world 
are you and Brad Paulson riding that 50 cal on top of this Humvee? So um, I want to talk about this scene in the movie where this Hollywood scene where you, uh, your character walks up to my character and says, I can't go back out there, man. Um, because I have never had a chance to tell you the backstory or tell you what was going on in my mind when you and I had this conversation in Somalia. So you want to get into it for a sec? For sure. I think, I think similarly, you know, we haven't had this conversation, but also, uh, you know, there were things that were going on in my brain and maybe sometimes the way something is said or something comes out, but, uh, yeah, it, it was a unique moment and something that probably helped shape, you know, the rest of my time in the army yeah. and, and position me to be able to do a lot more than what I thought I was able yeah. to do. So, well, I'm just going to say this right out, right out of the gate. Like you, one of the reasons why I consider you most courageous guy is what you did in the back of those Humvees, but also the conversation that you and I had, and the movie doesn't give this conversation justice. The book doesn't describe really what was going on there. Um, so quick, uh, you, um, I don't think you were with me when I pulled the Humvee off to the side. So just to catch the listeners up, you and I have been out on target. We were taking Blackburn back to the base, dropping him off. We get in the middle of this firefight, which to this day is probably the most intense gunfight I've ever been in. And Pella is shot and killed right next to us. Um, the vehicles are just hammered with bullets. And as soon as we get back, our platoon leader, Lieutenant Larry Morse, is sending us back out in the city streets, right? Go out and get the, go out to the, to the Durant crash site, see if anybody's alive out there. And just like the movie Black Hawk Down shows, um, there's a lot of blood. I won't go into all of the gory detail, but it's a mess in the back of this Humvee. And so I pull that one Humvee off behind the hangar to the water buffalo. No running water, just buckets and sponges. And I start to clean the blood up. I think Jeremy Kerr is with me, and it's just me and Kerr. And I, I think I asked you guys to go get some more ammunition, right? And get ready to roll out there. Yeah, that was kind of, I, I don't think that you saw the first half of this, which was as, I didn't even remember this correctly, but as we roll in through the gate and we clear our weapons, uh, I mean, I've been in a lot of gunfights since, since then. then yep. And there was something incredibly unique about that experience. One we didn't have any support. There wasn't some, you know, big brother isn't up there yeah. ready to lay waste. Spectre wasn't over your head. We, you didn't have a big reserve ready to come it, in and bail it, you out. Yeah, there was, you know, you're basically cut off. And even our contingencies weren't really contingencies. Right. We didn't have radios. We didn't have the ability to just communicate. I basically, from even going to the target, we were already getting engaged. And so I think we stopped along the way just to get there at some point dismounted maybe a number of times. Yeah. I could be remembering yeah. that incorrectly. Yeah. And so I'm I'm literally in the blind. Um, because I was a tab spec four, you were kind of servicing the privates and making sure that that was all going correctly. Um, I was freelancing with a saw gun. And Danny Mitchell, who was the TC in my vehicle, who was the other team leader, was uh, had the other privates kind of under control. So I literally was just kind of maneuvering around uh, doing, you know, what I could do. So when we got back, um, I, I was almost furious with just how things had played out and the fact that I was in the blind. I didn't know what was going on. There was no means for us to communicate, right. hey, here's what we're doing. You, you can't stand in the middle of the street <laughs> right. putting out information yeah. to the privates. Yeah. When, when the, and you know, the, the intensity of the gunfight and everything else. So we end up back at the hangar and in my mind, we were back from the mission. Uh -huh. I, I didn't even necessarily know that there weren't other vehicles following behind us or they weren't soon to follow. I clear my weapon and I am like in a rage. Uh -huh. There are guys from Larry Moore's two vehicles. Yep. I, so I don't remember this. They were out on a water supply. That's right. They were doing weren't, a resupply. Weren't initial. there with the initial yep. with the initial thing. And all these guys are are kind of looking at us like, man, what happened? Yeah. And I started kicking the vehicle. I'm throwing my stuff down. 
furious that I, I've just watched and witnessed my buddy get killed. Um, you know, Hey, there's a number of things that are happening that are going wrong. And in my mind, like, wow, we lived through that. Yeah. Here we are. And you know, when's everybody else coming right. back? And so that, that kind of at least mentally sets the stage for where I am. And, uh, and then hear that, <laughs> Hey, you know, there's a uh, Black Hawk that yeah. got shot down, and we're all going to go back out here and do this again. Yeah. Hey, uh, funny aside here, you know, I had this terse, for lack of a better word, uh, conversation with Bob Gallagher that makes it into the movie Black Hawk Down when he's screaming into the handset, "What's your status? And how many casualties? And what's going on?" And I, I broke all Ranger protocol and just yelled in the handset, "Pella's dead, and leave me alone. I'm fighting for my life out here." Yeah. Um. When I met up with Gallagher years later, he said, Jeff, I thought you just deserted us and ran away. And I'm like, are you kidding me, man? I was taking casualties back. I was, we were rolling back out there in and out of the city streets. He's like, I thought you just ran away scared. And until just, you know, until he and I sat down and talked, what, 10, 15 years later, he always thought that we ran away scared. So <laughs> as you just pointed out, um, we come back to the base. Um, we're shot to pieces. And honestly, at this point, Pill is the only guy that we know is dead, right? Like yeah. helicopters are down. Pilots survive that all the time. We don't know if anybody's alive or dead at the crash sites, but Pilla was shot in the forehead. And let's just be honest, it is a violent wound and he was dead before his body hit the floorboards. Sure. And you went, you witness it from with a front row seat. And we get back there and our boss is sending us back out into the city streets. And in my mind, I was thinking suicide mission. Yeah, that was that was where I was as well. And I guess the second part of my uh, I don't know what if I would call it um, not even hesitation. It was more like I know that there's a better way to skin this cat. Yeah. And and I'm angry that we as a unit didn't figure out right. another way to skin this cat yeah. before we're in a place where there's no escape. Yeah. So I know based on what I just witnessed and lived through, like this is really going to be bad. Yeah. We're all going to die. It's not, it, it's not, uh, you know, maybe a couple of guys get zinged. It's not that type of gunfight. This is nobody's going to yep. make it through this. Yep. And, you know, am I willing to, and I had never even at that point, necessarily come to peace with just my own mortality. Yeah. And it was really after our conversation that I I was able to do that. And there were a couple of things. I'll let you continue, but there were two things that stand out to me that I kind of took forward no, from that. Well, so just so you hear it from me, um, I'm watching them pull Pella's body off of the back of the Humvee. And this, you, you know, I've taken part with the regiment in Desert Storm in uh, uh, Kuwait. I've, I took part in uh, just cause I helped move the bodies and all of the wounded off of Torrios to Kuman and Rio Hata. Like I've been in firefights and I've been around bodies and I've been around blood and body bags. Um, but this initial push is the, is the most intense fight that I think I've ever seen. And I was thinking as a squad leader about you guys, okay, if I drive the squad back through what we just went through, a hundred percent of us are going to get killed. I'm not thinking about me. I'm thinking about you, Danny Mitchell, and everybody else on those Humvees. And my first reaction is you got to be insane to ask us to go back out there. Um, but just like the movie Black Hawk Down shows, one of the special operators came back in the vehicles with us and said, hey, hey, Sergeant, you probably go, need to go clean this Humvee up. So I pull this one Humvee off to the side and I start cleaning the blood off the back of the Humvee and Brad, what is going through my mind is exactly, here's what I want you to hear, is exactly what came out of your mouth a few minutes later. Cause I'm thinking, I can't go back out there, man. We're all gonna die if we go back out there. And as a squad leader, I'm sending my squad, the entire squad to their death. Like there's got to be a better, a better way. But yeah. as you know, man, this is, this is coming down from the boss and I'll, I'll do everything I can to argue for the squad. But at the end of the day, if, if we got to roll back out there, we got to roll out there. And I am just about ready to throw in the towel and say, I don't have it in me. When I start to get everybody rallied up, we pull the, the Humvee back off the side and get lined up, get our kit back on, getting ready to go out to the Durant crash site. And that's when you walk up to me. And what I've never had a chance to tell you to your face is you said out loud what had been going through my mind for the last 20 minutes before we rolled out there. And that's one of the reasons why I have the greatest respect for you. 
because everybody else was thinking it. I was thinking it. Everybody else was thinking it. Nobody, yeah. nobody wanted to say it, but everybody was thinking exactly what you just said when you looked me in the eyes and said, man, I can't do this. I can't roll back out there. Yeah. That was, uh, I'm, I'm looking at some of the other guys. So I kind of wrap up my rage and I'm looking at one of the other, I won't mention who, but was just kind of squatting, uh, smoking a cigarette with, you know, the yeah. most insane look on his face. And I'm looking, we're talking back and forth and there are other people that are witnessing our conversation. And it's almost uh -huh. like you're, you're on the periphery. Like you don't, you don't know, just sh shut up yeah. and, and let us have our little moment right. here. And we go back and forth a few times and I'm like, man, this is just nuts. This is crazy, and, right? You know, I'm also thinking still to some degree that, you know, I don't know what's going on. Where are we wrapped up? Are we close to infill or exfill? You know, what what's happening? And I guess, you know, my own personal safety, you know, was probably the first thing selfishly in my mind, but similar to you, it's not like I was trying to be protective of the privates or right. protective of everybody else. I just felt like this is the dumbest thing. We're we're literally, this is the dumb army yeah. that I can't this stand. And sending I, people out to their death. I didn't, I didn't join to be cannon fodder, uh, you know, like, like in the days of old where we just get online and right. shoot at each other across the field. So anyway, that was a, it was a big moment. i I feel like I had to say it. And, uh, you know, it, it caused me a lot of grief, a lot of shame, a lot of all of that over the years. And it's probably one of the things you know, that led me to want to continue to do more yeah. was maybe to get over that hump, to prove to myself that I had the guts to continue to go back out and do it. Once, once we rolled out the gate the second time, I was fine. I was, I was at peace and it wasn't because it was less intense. It wasn't because right. the gun, the gun fighting wasn't, uh, wasn't as, as uh, vicious as it was the first time. And then went out the third time and a little bit different the third yeah. time when, when it was dark and, you know, things had kind of quieted down somewhat, um, you know, but then it was almost like find the humor in things. Yeah. We were able to, you know, talk and kind of converse and everybody knew what we were in for and things like that. So, you know, I, I look back and I told you this the other day on the phone, but I look back at that moment and I, I've been in gunfights as an E8. I got nobody under me. You know, I'm a a two yeah. IC of a team on Delta force and basically no responsibility except uh -huh. for me and making sure I grab the breacher and he's going the right way. And I thought, you know, here's a young E six who, you know, has been given this task and I know he's as uncomfortable as I am, you know, yep. we're, we're both a little bit older than, right. than everybody else. And we're both thinking the same thing. And by the way, I want to point and, out you two, you and I are the only two that are married at this point, right? Everybody sure. else is single. And, and honestly, they're just thinking about them. Whereas you and I are thinking about somebody back at home waiting for us. Yeah. To, to some degree. Yeah. But it, it was more of, you know, for me, it was more about the stupidity of things, but I look back at that knowing what I know now, you know, so many years later. And I think, what a task to give a young E6 squad leader, not only get your guys, you know, up to snuff and get them back out there, but, oh, hey, navigate through a city without the aid of GPS, yeah. without the aid of any sort of ISR or something that's guiding you in real time, you know, no real ability to communicate, no benefit of close air support, you know, radios that maybe you're kind of talking to one another, right. all of that. And, that to me, you know, was one of hands down the most impressive piece of, of leadership that I've ever seen in the military. Wow. Whether I, whether I liked you, whether I didn't like you, whether I hated you for making <laughs> yeah, me go back out, right. whatever it might be that, you know, looking back on it, I really, you know, it, it, it's super impressive to know what you were able to accomplish. You got us all rounded up. Uh, you know, we went, grabbed as much ammo as we could prop, you know, possibly grab and, uh -huh. and, uh, and went back out. Hey, Brad, it's, it's sad that it's taken us 29 years to have this conversation, but man, what I needed you to hear from me is what you said gave me the greatest respect for you, man. I didn't think less of you. I thought more of you as a man, as a leader, 
um, as a warrior, understanding the situation and just recognize, look, any anybody can just blindly follow their boss into a mess. What you were saying is what everybody else was thinking. And what I also wanted you to hear is when I was cleaning up the back of that Humvee, every saying, everything that you said was going through my mind the whole time. And you just said out loud what I know everybody was thinking. And it slowed me down enough and made me think, man, I got to I got to stop for a second. So um, it's it's what caused me to respond. I, I think a lot of people were were watching this conversation and wondering how I was going to respond. And it caused me to respond and just be as patient with you as I could instead of, you know, losing my cool and acting like the typical Ranger Sergeant at that moment. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, this was a conversation that you and I had first. And then at some point you gathered the rest of the squad and you said, you know, Hey, I just had a conversation with Thomas here about going back out. And you basically gave everybody the same, you know, the same pep talk, which was, and I'll never forget it, but you said, you know, I'm scared too. And, you know, the difference between courage and cowardice is the ability and willingness to, you know, do the thing that you, know that you have to do you're you're going to be scared when you do it and and yeah. that's okay but you know is going out and doing it anyway so from there i know i don't think i was super happy with your answer <laughs> of course not and, and i wasn't okay. happy with that yeah. answer either just so you know yeah so i'm not i'm not happy with your answer i go back into the hangar and and i knew in my mind that it wasn't a question of i'm not going back out there it was more like I'm going to be vocal about the fact yeah. that I'm not happy right. about having to go do this because I think it's really a bad idea. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I go back in the hangar and one of the things that connected with me additionally was the tune uh, Rooster by Alice oh, in yeah, Chains. Oh yeah, absolutely. Was, was playing Love on that a, song. Was playing on the boom box that one of the 160 uh, crew had, you know, at his, at his cot. Yeah. And I heard the song. You can't snub the rooster. And right? I was like, man, just be the rooster. Yeah. And so, you know, those two things gave me the courage, the guts, whatever you want to call it, to go back out and, and face it a couple more times. And well, uh, yeah. Here's the truth, man. Um, and I'm not blowing smoke at this point. The, the proudest moment of my military career was when I was getting on the Humvees because I'm going to tell the secret that nobody wants to, uh, nobody else wants to say. Several guys who came back in, uh, back to the airfield and had the opportunity to roll back out into city streets didn't. They just decided I'm done and I can't go back out there. And I'm not going to fault them or throw rocks at them. Um, but you had the chance to just go scurry and hide in the corner and not go back out there. Um, and the proudest moment, hands down, of my entire career in the military was jumping on the Humvees. And I still wasn't sure if you were actually going to jump out there and jump back on the vehicles with us. And I looked in the rearview mirror and I watched you reach down, pick up your squad or your saw and get on the back of Mitchell's Humvee. And I was like, that is the bravest man I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. Because, Brad, here's what was going through my mind. What Thomas just decided is I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die, but if I don't go back out there, the guys at the Durant crash site won't make it. So I'm going to go trade my life for theirs. And yeah. all night long, you were on my mind when we were going rolling back out in the city streets. Like, what kind of a guy has that kind of guts? But not just guts. What kind of a guy loves the task force and the, and the dudes that we served with enough that you're saying, okay, I know it's going to be my night, but I'm going to do it so that those guys have a chance to go home to their family. That's the proudest moment that I've ever had leading warriors in combat. That's uh, that's kind of cool. It's a cool perspective that I didn't necessarily know. 29 and, uh, years too late to say that I should have yeah. said it to you 29 years ago. Yeah, man. right, right. Um, no, I think that's all a part of, you know, it's all a part of growth and everything else. And it was a different, not touchy-feely you know, military back then, things were different. I remember, uh, to throw a little bit of humor in there, I remember as we're driving out, so the second time was still middle of the day. Yep. And, you know, we got we got hacked up pretty good again and uh, ran into some of the other vehicle convoy that was out driving around doing the same thing that we had been doing. And 
Anyway, when we went out that night, I remember seeing like a glow of fire off to my left and, you know, there are some helicopters doing gun runs and there are things happening. And I remember as we're driving one direction, saying to everybody in my vehicle, yeah, well, at least we're not going that way. <laughs> yeah, because we within, know what that way's like and it's no fun. Within Within a... 30 seconds of me saying that we make a left turn on, head, the, on national right street. There. Yep. Yep. <laughs> on national street. I remember I'm like, okay, well, it's and I also that. remember that as soon as we turned that left turn on national street, the city just erupted like the 4th of July and everything yeah. was going off in every direction. I was thinking, here we go again. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, let's just go to the second half of your career. I bring up this moment when you and I meet each other in Baghdad in Iraq, because most of the guys, you already know this, that were in Somalia, they got their fill of the military in one night and they decided I'm done and I'm moving on to other things and it's all good. But Brad, you didn't, you stuck around the Ranger Regiment. You literally went on to bigger and better things in the Ranger Regiment by going to recon and then moved on to the, the, the most talented warriors on the planet and served with us in that special mission unit for the rest of your career. And for the rest of my time in the military, when I heard people talking about you and what you were doing, I, I, I was just blown away by who you are. Um, I also, uh, real quickly, I also want to talk about Brad Paulson, who was sitting, standing right above me. So I've got you in the vehicle behind me and Paulson in the, on the 50 cal above me. And although he's wounded multiple times on that 50 cal yeah. and I order him off of the 50 cal, he refuses to give his gun up and stays on it all night long. And I thought to myself, man, where do guys like this come from? This is incredible. The kind of people that I had the chance to serve with. It's no wonder um, that if there was a way, uh, you know, if it was possible to survive, it's no wonder I survived with people like Brad Paulson above me and you behind me. I think it's, uh, I think it's important for, you know, I, I know that people that lived during that time understand it to some degree, but the military is just so different than yeah. it is today. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't join thinking I'm going to combat and that's not an mm -hmm. excuse for, but but in that moment, in, in that gunfight, things went from, hey, we're in the military, we're doing whatever it is we're doing, to all of a sudden, okay, we're in wartime environment. And there was a whole lot of catch up yeah. emotionally, mentally, uh, psychologically that had to happen. And from, from the very first rounds that were cracking past me, I didn't even, as an example, understand that it was the bullets that were cracking. And... I saw pieces of sidewalk and wall starting to kind of chink, chink, chink. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's when I recognized. So when, when I got out of the vehicle for the first time, I looked over at Dom and I yelled, and I don't know if he could even hear me, but I yelled, uh, what are they shooting at us? 22s? Because I didn't recognize or even. <laughs> the sound of AK-47 fire? Well, it, it was the crack. And yeah. it's not. It's not like you're hearing the report of the yeah, weapon. You're yeah. just hearing the crack of the bullet. And uh, it wasn't until I kind of pieced that together that, oh, okay. So I, I yelled at him, hey, what are they shooting at us, 22s? And he was just across the street on the other side of the vehicle and uh, looked at me and smiled. And that's like, I'll, I'll never forget yeah. that visual yeah. of him smiling. Like, I'll take that to my grave. Yeah. I got to tell you a funny story. It'll be on another time um, about me running up to get to Captain Steele to figure out where Brad uh, or where uh, Todd Blackburn is. And they're under gunfight, a gunfire. But I've been I've been shot at enough to know, man, it's well over our head and it's it's not something to be worried about. But they're ducking after the bullets pass over their head, every single bullet. <laughs> it's just consistent bullets over their head and they're ducking like a half a second too late. And I'm like, guys. It's far enough over your head. You don't have to duck. And if you have to duck, you're probably going to get your head shot off anyway. So where is Blackburn? Um, anyway. Oh, that's funny. Um, so, so I went, you know, when we got back from Mogadishu, I don't, I don't know if you know this or if, well, you may, I'm sure you knew it, but I don't know if you would remember it. I had in the summer of 93 uh, requested to go to the recon detachment. I wanted to go to their selection course, which was, actually supposed to happen in October of 93. Yeah. And it kind of put me on the back, you know, burner as far as promotion. And right. we, we did a, well, I think we did a promotion board over in Mogadishu. Yeah, we did. 
Yep. And I kind of got left off of that because I had raised my hand and said, you know, hey, I want to go do this recon thing. And when we got back, I don't I don't know if it was a conversation with you or if it was a conversation with Rick Merritt, but said, hey, I, I feel and would feel like I'm abandoning you if I just up and left and went, you know, to do this recon thing. I will help, you know, rebuild the squad, help rebuild yeah. the platoon however you need me. Uh, to serve in whatever capacity, you know, made E5 very quickly and was sent to all the schools and become a team leader and then acting squad leader and got a chance to work with Aaron Weaver yeah. and and all of that. So that was probably not because it was post Mogadishu and that was all behind us, but that was probably my favorite time of my time in B Company was that last year kind of helping mentor new yeah. privates as they came in and impart some wisdom of, uh, you know, hey, here's what we really need to be right. focused on. Um, there was a a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance to this was one company out of how many yeah. that got to do this yeah. thing at a time of no war. And there were conversations such as, well, now you guys can get back and, you know, get into the important things like getting your boot shine. <laughs> right. And, yeah. You know, making sure your TA-50 yeah. is squared away for inspection and things like that. And you know, that was that was really kind of a turning point, start of a turning point in the Ranger Regiment to say, all right, these are the important things. Or we don't need to right. sit around at 1730 every night waiting on the word from the uh -huh. first sergeant. We know we're coming in for PT at six yep. in the morning. We know what we need to do. Uh, starting to get out to the range, do a lot more shooting, do a lot more, you know, close quarter uh, combat kind of training and things like that. So I stuck around for about 16 months, I believe, maybe maybe 18 months after that. And then I went to the recon detachment. Yeah. And uh, you know that I got moved not long after we got back and got sent over to take over the, the weapons squad. And uh, it was it was bittersweet for me. Like, I did not want to leave um, you guys in the line and go over to take over weapons squad. It was a it was a great experience for me. But um, man, I'll 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 I, I just want to say again to you. When I watched you all night long, I sat there in those uh, in that Humvee thinking to myself, what he's doing right now is essentially saying I'm giving my life up and I'm doing it so that the guys that are out here in the city have a chance to survive. And I've never seen an act of more selfless service and bravery than what I witnessed from you. And from Brad Paulson, who when he and I talked, he I, I, I tried to say the same thing to him. Um, how much uh, th the two of you just blew me away on that battlefield. Well, I, uh, I appreciate it. I don't, you know, I still don't necessarily feel that way. I understand what you're saying. And I guess it's a perspective that I've never really thought about, but yeah, it was definitely one of those, one of those things. You know, I, I talk a lot and have done a lot of podcasts and media and things uh -huh. like that. And one of the things that I always try and let people know is I know far more people that have been killed in training Yep. than have been killed right. in combat. Yeah. True story. Like, not even close. And, you know, I feel like stepping off the ramp of an aircraft, no matter when, no matter what, stepping into a helicopter, mm -hmm. it's all risk. And you don't necessarily think of it that way, you know. And that's what I mean about everything kind of had to catch up yeah. to, all right, hey, we're all going to die. We're all going to die together, though. And I think that was another piece of comfort. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's fast forward. Um, now you're a father and you have a son that is serving in the military and not only serving in the military, but kind of following almost not totally in your footsteps. Man, tell me what it feels like to see this happen now to your son um, to watch what he's going through. I uh, I try not to be the the old guy that's like <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you about yeah, how it let was me tell back, you back you know? in the day. Yeah, I try not to do that. When he uh, he he's two years of college, he got a uh, football scholarship and all right, right as COVID hit. So he got to school and basically everything got locked yeah. down and he couldn't play football for two years. And I don't think that he ever enjoyed football so much. Uh -huh. for the football as much as he did for the feeling of a sense of team and feeling of camaraderie and those types of things. So um, he comes home from school in May and says, you know, I, I can't do anything that I believe in. Yeah. I can't talk about anything that I believe in. 
I'm being pushed an agenda and I'm not learning anything. And I, I really am not having fun. Uh, I want to join the army and I was time out. <laughs> You know, but yeah. Don't join the army yeah. because you that's hate not college. a gut reaction, right. a knee jerk reaction. Right. right. And I said, OK, well, you know, let's talk about that. This is the first time ever hearing of it. Like it never came up with either one of my yeah. kids, you know, as military being an option. And I didn't want them to feel like they had to try and live up to something. Uh, I wouldn't compare myself to Ozzy Osbourne, but right. I can't imagine being you know, Jack Osborne yeah. and trying to live up to this thing that your dad is like, it's bigger than life. Right. So I didn't want him to feel that way, especially with where I ended up serving in Delta force and, and everything else. So I talked to him, you know, Hey, well, what do you want to do? You could be a truck driver. Right. You could be a radar technician. You could, you know, do something medical, whatever it is. And he said, well, I think, I think I'd like to do the Ranger thing. <laughs> And you know, and there you was, were picked yourself off the ground, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a huge sense of, you know, pride and and all of that. But also, too, I feel like back then there was really no information yeah. available. There wasn't an internet. You couldn't look at your phone at pictures of guys deployed to see their gear and right. what they had. Um, you know, all that stuff is so much more well known now. I feel like it was easier for me to some degree because. Everything was just yeah. unknown. Yeah. I didn't, nobody in my family had been in the military. Mine either. Um, nobody told me, hey, you need to be prepared yep. to do this. I literally showed up, got my head shaved and, you know, okay, <laughs> what's what next? I was told, what they told <laughs> yeah, me to yeah. do. Yep. Where do I go? I didn't understand uh, basic training and AIT and airborne school yeah. and ranger indoctrination. I didn't even understand what all that stuff was. To me, it was kind of like one big thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting when you talk about, you know, going from RIP back in those days to the recon detachment, one of the things that that crossed my mind when you said that is that that's literally what I thought I was getting into. Yeah, right. I didn't I didn't join thinking I'm gonna get hazed and harassed and you know, and nothing that I didn't return the favor right, to right. others. Of course. You know, I'm not saying there was any abuse or anything like that, obviously, but that wasn't something that I necessarily predicted. I thought it was going to be more like the Vietnam era, uh -huh. you know, make it through whatever. And now you're on the team. And uh, I didn't understand privates or sergeant, you know, like I didn't yeah. understand the rank structure or any of that stuff. So there was a steep learning curve. And that's one of the things that I feel like at least he's better prepared for yeah. it. But I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Well, it's one thing to be a warrior. It's another thing to raise a warrior. And I, I try to say this uh, to military families all the time, man. Um, it tells a little bit about your patriotism, the fact that your son wants to be a warrior. And it tells kind of the house that he grew up in. So um, I'm, I can't imagine uh, how proud you are of him. Actually, yeah. I can. I don't know if you're aware of this. I had a son who joined the military, went straight to the Air Force, but I had another son who joined the Army, went to the Ranger Regiment, spent a few years in SECO, oh, wow. um, and then ended up uh, doing one enlistment and leaving. And I got a chance to see the Ranger Regiment through his eyes. And it was just, man, it was awesome to be able to see, uh, you know, what he went through. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't ever expect it. And I think that yeah. was one of the other things that it just took me by surprise. So to see him graduate basic training and get ready to head to AIT, none of none of which is a huge challenge, but it's an accomplishment, and it's you know it's the it's the building blocks yeah. that are going to get him to the next place. Right. So I'm excited for whatever he does. And one of the only things that I said to him, you know, was don't feel like you have to live up to anything I did. Um, I I don't. I don't want you to feel any pressure for me at all. My exact same the, words the to my children. Only yep. thing, exact words. The only thing I'm going to tell you is just don't quit. Yeah. If you get there and you decide this isn't for me, cool. But just don't quit. Yeah. And uh, there's no reason to start something you can't finish. Yep. You're going to be in the best yep. place that you can be and you know, make your decision after you get there. My so. exact same words. Don't try to live up to your dad's reputation. Be your own man. Yeah. Do your own thing, and I will be proud of you no matter what. But like you, don't quit, because <laughs> um, that's basically what got us through, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, let's make this uh, interview now go full circle, and let's wrap up talking about silence and light. Um, I've been listening to your music, man. Um, to this day, I think you are an exceptional musician. 
Talk to us a little bit about getting the band started. And by the way, you've got another album, a second album that's in the works. So give everybody an update on where things are with the next album. For sure. So I, I didn't uh, intend this to be a band. It was something that, uh, you know, through other things that I do, I, I contribute pretty significantly back to the community yeah, in do. which I serve. You really do. Yep. And, you know, whether it's uh, designing things that are being used by uh, folks in, you know, SOCOM or whatever it might be, um, or charitable contribution uh -huh. that I'm able to provide and things like that, I wanted to do something personal from me. And I, I was fortunate in that I feel like I didn't really struggle um, retiring from the Army. You know, right. I did eight years in the Ranger Regiment. I did... 12 years in Delta Force, and I, I loved a lot of it. I was kind of ready to get out and start a new chapter. And to be honest, after about four deployments uh, in, in Delta Force, I was ready to, okay, what's next? I, I just don't want to be on the hamster wheel here. Yeah. And, you know, I've done all the cool things that you can do, a lot of it, and I'm ready for another challenge. So by the time, you know, 20 years hits, I'm, I'm ready to get out. And I knew part of that was going to be my identity is, is what is it? You know, I'm losing my identity. This thing that I sacrificed, you know, to be and be a part of for 20 years is going to go away. And I don't want to be the guy that's, you know, sitting around talking about <laughs> back in the good you know, old telling, days, telling barrack stories yeah. and things like yeah. that. Although there's some of that. Um, my wife and I would go out and, and have like a Friday night date night uh, every Friday. And it's one of the things, you know, even with kids and things like that, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were solid first and we're on the same page and enjoying one another and staying connected. And um, I would talk to her about, you know, I, I feel like I'm a ship, as corny as this sounds, like I'm a ship out on the ocean and I'm just looking for the light. Like, just tell me what you want me to do. Uh, I'm happy to help. However, you know, I, I've already served, so I can't do that. But what what can I do? Uh, and one week, you know, she might recommend something like politics. And maybe you should, you know, try and make changes in something, you know, like that. Yeah. Or maybe whatever it might be. Um, this went on for a couple of years. And one day, I'm in this room in my house, which is loaded with guitars and amps and all kinds of stuff like that. And I, I played all the time, yeah. but she comes in and she says, you know, it's a shame you're not doing anything with all this stuff. And with this gear to get it out of the house because I'm crawling all over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus you're really, really good at it. Yeah. So it's a shame that you're not, you know, doing something with this. The next day, it didn't, nothing clicked then. The next day, I was driving into Manhattan to meet uh, a buddy of mine named Jason Everman. And Jason served in the Rangers, uh -huh. and he was in uh, both Nirvana and Soundgarden before joining the Rangers. And, you know, back then, there was no internet. Yeah. But when he hit the ground in 2nd Ranger Battalion, I think I knew about it, yeah. found out through it the grapevine. Shockwaves, because, right? Because people knew, you know, I played guitar and, and was in bands and stuff. And they're like, you're not going to believe this. There's a dude from Nirvana in 2nd Ranger Battalion. And everybody's like, yeah, sure, right. Anyway, um, he and I connected, you know, years later and have been great friends ever since. And I was driving to meet him in Manhattan to go see a uh, Mastodon concert. And all of a sudden the light bulb went off and I thought, I'm going to ask Jason, you know, to do something with yeah. music. He's been out of it for a long time. I've been out of it a long time. Let's put some music out and let's take royalties and contribute those to charitable organizations that we believe in that service yeah. our community. And that was really the concept. And within a week, put together a social media page and just started, you know, what little you can do, right? Uh, you know, trying to explain to people what you're doing, uh, through Instagram and stuff uh -huh. like that, uh, you know, tried to say, Hey, this is, this is what I'm doing. And it just, it just grew, you know, from a uh, Marsoc officer who had just gotten out mm -hmm. after 12 years in, in the Marine Corps. And he says, Hey, I don't know what you got going on, but I want to be a part of this. Yeah. And I said, well, do you play an instrument? He says, yeah, I play bass. I'm like, all right, <laughs> let's, You're let's, in. let's meet up. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, what kind of music do you like? And it just kind of went from there. Right. So, you know, drummer comes on board all the way to the point of, 
multi Grammy award winning uh, producer named Josh Goodwin, uh-huh. uh, G U D W I N. He hits me up through social media and says, I want to help. You know, how can I help? Yeah. I'm a veteran and I, I want to do something. And I said, Well, do you want to produce the album? Sure. Uh, so I looked the guy up and was just blown away by his resume, most of which I don't know, uh-huh. not my genre of music, right. but uh, some really well-known folks. Uh, anyway, so it just kind of kind of went from there, and that's that's exactly what we're doing. We're selling music, we're streaming music on all the platforms that you would normally get or listen to uh-huh. anything. And we're taking the royalties from that, and we're contributing those to uh, Warrior's Heart, which is a facility in Texas. Uh-huh. was founded by a former A Squadron yeah. Delta Force guy, a uh, buddy of mine. But it treats people for PTSD. And you could be a first responder. You could be you know, a person that worked closely with COVID patients mm-hmm. and witnessed a lot of trauma with that. It could be special operations people or just uh, you know, regular military folks. So... They have a facility, they do PTSD counseling, and one of the things that connected with me, aside from it being stood up by a buddy of mine, is they use art as a form of therapy, whatever it might be, whether it's welding, sculpting, uh, writing, poetry, Mm -hmm. music, you know, all of that. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing. That's cool, man. You've got another album. So the uh, a single just came out for the newest album, uh, but you've got another album in the works. Can you give everybody an update? Yeah, it's uh, been a labor of love. And, uh, you know, with COVID, one of the things that was a, a benefit, we couldn't really play shows the way we were yeah. hoping to. But, you know, everybody in the music industry kind of ended up in the same place. Uh-huh. And most people wrote uh, wrote music. And use the time to do that because yeah. that was one of the only things you could do. So, like the Chili Peppers just dropped uh-huh. two albums this year alone, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. But uh, we spent, you know, all of 2022, 21 and 22 uh, writing and recording. So, we're in the process of doing all the mixing. It'll go to mastering here in the next two months and probably release springtime. Is there an album name that people need to be on the lookout for? Uh, I mean, if you Google the band Silence and Light or you put that into yeah. any of the platform stuff where you would get music normally, it'll it'll show up. But I think the the working title is Coulda, Shoulda, Woulda. <laughs> All right. And yeah. it's it's really the uh, album cover. I'll show it to you when we uh, when we uh, finish this up. Uh-huh. But it's a it's an homage to '90s era anti commercialism bands. All right. You know? So. In the '80s, everybody was, you know, had the look yeah. and looked a certain way, and the music was horrible. Right. Uh, I tell was, my children that they don't know what I had to, you and I had to live <laughs> yeah, through yeah. '80s era music. Yep. Yeah. Some of it was just absolutely god awful. And then when grunge hit, it was really, you know, a shout out to anti-commercialism, yeah. and you could wear flannel, you could wear uh-huh. torn blue jeans. It didn't matter how you looked. Uh, it was all about the music. And so, the the cover to the new album is just just that. But I get a lot of people that hit me up on social media and they all say the same thing. And there's a coulda, shoulda, woulda to it. And most people have regret. They yeah. they make a decision uh-huh. at some point and they, they, they still look back on it and they regret, you know, I could have done this. Right. I should have done that. And I tell everybody the same thing. And that is, you're on the path you're supposed to be yeah. on. You made a decision based on the things at the time that yeah. made sense to you. Don't don't have any regrets about yeah. that. You know, uh, I got two messages last night. In fact, with the same exact thing. Yeah. And uh, so coulda, shoulda, woulda. It's kind of meant to be, you know, talking about that. Yeah. Man, that's great. Hey, if you're interested, just go look on your favorite music platform for Silence and Light. You're going to be blown away by Brad's skill on the guitar and all that this band is doing. Man, thank you for taking a little bit of time and um, doing this interview with me. But I've really been looking forward to this, Brad, because there's a couple of things that have been on my mind about you for almost 30 years now. And I finally got a chance to say them to you face to face. Well, I I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate you saying it, you know, but the feeling is mutual and that, you know, the last thing I'll kind of wrap up with is the new project that I'm working on, yeah. which is intended to be kind of a behind the scenes. Uh, you know, I want this to be a, a serial, not a not a one-time thing, uh-huh. but this is going to start with kind of a behind the scenes of Black Hawk Down yeah. and not, 
not intended to be the e true Hollywood story, right, but right. really some of the the things that you and I are talking about right now, it's getting into things like that yeah. with a lot of other people that participated. It's an A list uh, crew that's going to be involved with it, you included, and uh, and a handful of others. So anyway, I'm psyched about that. That should be hitting sometime next summer. Well, we're going to put links to Silence and Light. We're going to put links to your social media, but I'm going to put some links out there to Warrior's Heart because I want people to know about that. And if you're looking for this Veterans Day weekend, a great military charity to support, why don't you send them some money or why don't you come alongside them and help them make a big difference? And so if you if you buy uh, the album on iTunes, that contributes more money just because more royalties mm -hmm. are generated from that. But I didn't want to start something that was asking people for money. So unwittingly, whether you buy or stream this stuff, you're contributing you're to a money. charitable, yeah. you're, you're giving right. money. And uh, that kind of fit perfectly with the other thing, which I just didn't want to ask people. Um, if you want to help support the band, we've got merchandise. And, you know, this stuff isn't free. It costs to the tune yeah. of about $35,000 to record the first album. And, you know, hotels aren't free. Right. Or studio fees aren't free. Yeah. free. Um, it all costs money. So if, if, People want to support the band and helping us offset some of the costs. If they buy merchandise, yeah. that directly, you know, goes to us. And if they wanted to donate a tour bus or two, you guys yeah, would take cool that, that too, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Just as long as it has a 70 inch and a hot, a hot tub. <laughs> right. In it. Yeah. Man, thanks for being on this episode. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Hey, there you have it from Brad's own mouth. He's the kind of guy that made it through one of the most challenging moments of his life, and it went on to serve him for many years afterwards. And if there's a lesson that you can learn from Brad's story, it is if you can get through the really big challenge that you might be facing right now, if you can make it through this challenge, the lessons that you learn can make you stronger for the rest of your life. So if you're facing that real big challenge right now at work, at home, maybe in your personal life. Don't give up, don't quit, just hang in there. And if you can get through this, man, you can get through whatever life throws at you next. Thank you for joining me for this really special Veterans Day weekend episode of Unbeatable. If you found this podcast for the first time, why don't you go ahead and subscribe and we'll give you other great episodes along the way. If you haven't started following us on social media, go ahead and search at Unbeatable Podcast on just about any social media platform. And why don't you go ahead and become part of the Unbeatable Army? All you got to do is go to unbeatablearmy.com. Well, we'll deliver you great resources. We'll send content directly to your inbox and you'll become part of this powerful community of people that are facing life's biggest challenges together. Thanks for joining me. See you next week.